One of the things you notice when you come to the book of 1 Corinthians is that the church of Corinth had a lot of problems. Most of the book is Paul addressing those problems. Right out of the gate we find that the church was very divided. There were people in the congregation actually saying things like, I'm of Peter, I'm of Paul, I'm of Jesus. We get to the fifth chapter and we find that in the congregation was a man who was guilty of such sexual immorality that Paul said is not even named among the Gentiles. Even the believers aren't guilty. unbelievers are guilty of things like this. They're not. He then later talked about in chapter 11 of the Lord's Supper. Corinth was abusing the Lord's Supper to the point you had people getting drunk and some, Paul said, had fallen asleep. At least they had spiritually died, if not physically died. The church had a lot of problems. And we might be inclined to think in a situation like that, is anything going right? Well, for all of Corinth's problems, there were things that were going right. And among those, in chapter 14, was that Corinth had people who wanted to be involved. Probably one of the curses of modern-day America is people who are very happy to fill pews, but very disinterested in being involved. For all of Corinth's problems, that wasn't one of theirs. You had people coming to the Lord's Day Assembly, we find in that chapter, coming prepared to be involved, and so much so that there was confusion. Paul says God's not the author of confusion, but the implication was your assemblies are confusion. There was an order, even though there should have been. People were participating over each other, and there was disorder. Paul said things need to be done decently and in order. So what's the solution? Well, Paul didn't discourage the mutual edification. He didn't discourage all those members being involved. Rather, he sought only to order it. So he told them in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 27, if you're going to have people who speak with tongues involved, which of course they need to be, make sure you only have two or three, and then make sure they take turns. He said the same thing about prophets. Let them be two or three involved on Sunday, and then let each of them take turns. By so doing, the service could become ordered and edifying. Imagine, once Corinth got their service as it should be, what it would have been like. What would it have been like to meet with Corinth Sunday after Sunday, knowing that each service you weren't going to be going to hear the same man, but you'd be going to hear different ones? That the focus wouldn't be on one, but rather on one another. It would have been very different from what we're accustomed to today, wouldn't it? Strikingly dissimilar. Paul tells the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians four different times that what he commanded them, he commanded everywhere else. So we can't say that this was some unusual circumstance. Furthermore, when we look at other churches in the New Testament, we find that they had many involved as well. One of those churches is Antioch. In, A in Acts chapter 13, verse 1, we read that in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers. Just as God had inspired multiple people at Corinth, He had inspired multiple people at Antioch. There were also many teachers involved. There was a multiplicity of ministers, lowercase m, a plurality of participants. Later on in Acts chapter 15, verse 35, when Paul and Barnabas have come back to the city, we find that they remained there teaching and preaching, not by themselves, but with many others also. Even when an apostle was present, the teaching and preaching wasn't assigned exclusively to him. There were many involved. Many had the gift, so many were involved. In Ephesus existed a similar situation. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5, we find that Timothy was an evangelist. Now, Timothy was at Ephesus. We find this in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. And Paul told him to remain in Ephesus, but not for the purpose of doing all the teaching. Rather, Paul said, remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Timothy wasn't there to be the resident exhorter. He wasn't there to be the sole preacher. He was there to help others teach the truth. In 2 Timothy 2, verse 2, Paul told Timothy to commit the truth to faithful men that they may be able to teach others also. Timothy wasn't there to fill a position, a job, but rather he was there working himself out of a job, working himself out by working others in. The picture we get is that in the New Testament you had many people who could have called themselves a minister of the church, but no one regarded himself as the minister of a church. Many had the gift, so many were involved. There are other passages affirming this belief among the New Testament believers. Romans 15, 14, Paul said that you're filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 16, Paul says the church is going to grow by the effective working when every part does its share. And to corroborate this, if we needed it, we have history. 
Interestingly, regardless of denominational affiliation, ancient historians unanimously declared that the first century apostolic church was a church where many were involved in the teaching and preaching. Philip Schaff, in his work, History of the Christian Church, Volume 1, page 124, writes this, In the apostolic church, preaching and teaching were not confined to a particular class. But every convert could proclaim the gospel to unbelievers, and every Christian who had the gift could pray and teach and exhort in the congregation. In his second volume of that same work, page 225, he says, Preaching was at first, when the church was under the apostles, free to every member who had the gift of public speaking, but was gradually, after the apostles were gone, confined to an exclusive privilege of the clergy. Richard and Painter, in their book, Christian Worship, Its Principles and Forms, write this. With the exception of women, every Christian, by virtue of his priesthood, was allowed to teach the church. There were no functions especially reserved for ministerial or clerical hands. And finally, A. H. Newman, in his book, Manual of Church History, page 141, writes this. The participation in worship was not confined to the official members, but to every male member it was permitted to utter his apprehension of truth. The New Testament church was a body of believers that God had imbued with gifts, both miraculous and natural. And in that setting, according to 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, where a gift existed, it was to be used. In the assembly, out of the assembly, but it was to be used. What are your gifts? Do you have the gift of teaching? Do you have the gift of public speaking? Maybe you use it at work. Maybe you use it at school. Do you use it in the church? If not, why not? Let me present a couple of questions to open up our discussion. Is there any biblical reason for not applying the model we've seen in these New Testament churches? Applying it today. Is there any reason why we wouldn't? And secondly, if we were to do it, what benefits might we stand to gain? I look forward to reading and replying to your comments. Thanks for watching.